So today we'll have a small intimate discussion of structured grids, which is just fine. And uh, in addition to this topic, I have a few slides on how to structure class projects and pointers to lots of old class projects that people have done, which you may or may not need for inspiration, but you're welcome to look at it. So just to remind everybody of where we are, we, we've been working our way through the motifs. We've done the dense uh, motif, the sparse motif, uh, and uh, we've done uh, end body, and now we're up to structured grids. And there's an awful lot of applications for structured grids, but to pick one that's going to kind of tie together all the different algorithms that I want to talk about, um, I mean, I could talk about image segmentation, but I'm going to talk about one we've done before, which is solving Laplace's equation, because all these different methods for improving them can be applied to that, and we'll see the successive levels of, of improvement. So I'll quickly review what Laplace's equation is, Poisson equation, where it comes from in PDEs, overview the methods for it. I had this table which went from, you know, dense Gaussian elimination where you ignore the structure. We're going to get all the way up to multigrid today, which is optimal, where it, it solves an n by n linear system in order n time, and it parallelizes very nicely too. But to get there, I'm going to have to work my way up through some simpler uh, iterative methods that use structured grids. Jacobi, red, black, SOR, because those are going to be building, those are not going to run optimally, but they're going to be building blocks for the ultimate uh, optimal algorithm, which is multigrid. There's one other algorithm which is also could be the fastest way to solve Poisson's equation. That uses the fast Fourier transform. We'll have a lecture on that later. So just to remind you of the three different kinds of PDEs, they're all solved with structured grid uh, methods, or, or can be solved with structured grid methods. There's basically wave equations, steady state stuff like gravity and, uh, and electrostatics, and then parabolic systems, things like the heat equation. And so the hyperbolic systems, there are the sort of the easiest ones to map to structured grids because uh, all these waves move at a finite speed, the speed of sound, the speed of light. So you set up your structured grid, and at every, grid, at every time step, every grid point has to average with its nearest neighbors. That's the most natural thing you can do on a grid. And that's an explicit time stepping, and that's, that's very straightforward. Then the elliptic, that's the hard case, that's solving Poisson's equation because everybody depends on everybody, and we've seen that pattern before. And just as we had clever ideas for fast multipole, for example, to make it cheap, even though everybody depended on everybody, we're going to use a similar idea to make multigrid go that fast. And then parabolic is time dependent, unlike gravity or electrostatics, but at every time step, you have to solve an elliptic problem in order to figure out how to move with the next time step. So, so this is sort of, you know, is at least as hard as this one. And I'm just going to focus on the elliptic case because that'll be good enough to illustrate everything. So again, think of gravity, think of electrostatics. So let me just have one slide summary of what the uh, hyperbolic case is, where all you do is you average with your neighbors, because this is going to be a prototype for everything else I do, Jacobi's method and so forth. And so um, what I'm going to do is take a time step and update by averaging with the neighbors. The time step can't get too big. It's going to depend on the speed of waves, and that's discussed in other classes. And so what am I doing in the inner loop? I'm averaging with the nearest neighbors. So this has a lot in common with everything that we use to, to optimize sparse matrix vector multiply, because I'm just taking linear combination with the neighbors. But I'm going to be able to do even better than what I did before for optimizing sparse matrix vector multiply, because now I don't actually have to store the matrix entries. And I don't have to store where they are, because it's a structured grid. I'm going to be doing the same averaging, the same matrix entries, with neighbors who are, let's say, left and right. And so I don't have to store their indices. And so just to make the notation, which I'm going to use later, I'm going to have uh, a, an array of the unknowns. The first subscript is going to tell me the position, so this is one-dimensional. So J is going to go from 0 to 5, say. That'll be the, the position. And then I is going to be the time step. So I equals 0 is my initial time, and then 1, 2, 3, multiplied by some time step. And so I have some initial conditions at time 0. And I have some boundary conditions on the sides when j equals 0 and j equals 5. And then at every time step to update, as the wave you know, bounces from one side to the other, I'm going to take the uh, solution at time, let's say, i, and at position j. The solution at my left and right neighbors at the same time, compute some sort of average, and get the answer one time step later. So here's the inner loop. I'm just going to walk through all the time steps, starting from 0, 1, 2, 3. And then, for every mesh point, physical mesh point, I'll take the value of, at, at time i, at the current time, of my value j, my left neighbor j minus 1, my right neighbor j plus 1, some linear combination, and get the new value. 
So this is the canonical thing that you do inside the inner loop of all of these. And there I've just written the inner loop one more time from the previous slide. How do I get to position j time step i plus 1? And I want to recognize that since I'm just taking a linear combination of everything, it really is a sparse matrix vector multiply. Of course, I never want to write down the sparse matrix, but to think about it mathematically, I just want to recognize that what do I do to get from the vector of solutions at time step i to time step i plus 1 is just multiply by this nice, simple tridiagonal matrix where there's constants down the diagonals, each diagonal, so I don't, I don't have to store those separately. And if I take out the z, which is sort of depends on the time step and and the, uh, and the distance between adjacent points, and just take out this constant matrix L, I see it's that Laplacian that we've seen so many times. So it's the degree of the graph down the diagonal and nev negative ones in the off diagonal, and this, this constant buries inside of it everything about how I've discretized the problem. So this is a hopefully just review. I'm just setting it up again. So this is the uh, Laplacian, and it's a, it's a three-point stencil, average with their neighbors. And in two dimensions, I'd be averaging with my north, south, east, and west neighbors. And in 3D, it's the usual, I have, have seven neighbors. And so here, just to draw it one more time, there's the matrix. And I don't need to store all those entries. All I need to know is that for each mesh point, I'll multiply it by two and subtract negative one times uh, my two neighbors and add it to each point. So that's the stencil that I'm going to apply. And there's the two-dimensional case. If I were to write it out as a matrix and number the unknowns from left to right and then from top to bottom, I'd get fours down the diagonal, and then I'd subtract negative one times all my four neighbors, so each row has four negative ones in it, and that's what it would look like. So that's solving that in some clever way on this nice mesh is what I want to do. And eventually, my goal is to do it in order n time, even though it's, they're in unknown, so optimal. So again, just for review, here's the table I put up a long time ago of all the different methods for solving that particular problem for both the two-dimensional case in black and the three-dimensional case if it differs in red. Starting with the algorithm that ignores all the structure, just runs dense Gauss elimination, a really dumb thing to do, Cauchy n cubed, all the way down to the optimal algorithm that I'll get to today, which runs in optimal sequential time, order n. And, and the lower bound is n because the size of the output is n. If I were to run on a magical, perfect parallel machine called a PRAM, where I had as many processors as I wanted, and communication were free, and I could just do everything, you know, do all the work I wanted at one time, then the complexity is a little bit more compressed. I could do Gaussian elimination in n steps, and these two guys are now log steps. And here's the memory and so forth. So today, my goal, I've talked about all the other ones uh, in other lectures. Well, FFT will be a future lecture. I'm going to talk about Jacobi. I'm going to remind you briefly about conjugate gradient because it also is a structured mesh. I'll do red, black, SOR, and those two are both the building blocks for multigrid, which will be the optimal algorithm. So let me start with Jacobi. And I'll, I'll just take a couple slides to explain how it works, where it comes from. And so here is the equation I want to solve for, now I have a two-dimensional mesh, so I and J are my, you know, X and Y coordinates. And so what I want to do at every point is I want the value of the solution to be the average of all of its four neighbors. So I minus one, the neighbor to the left, the neighbor to the right, the neighbor below, the neighbor above, and my right-hand side. So I'm solving T times U equals B. U are the unknowns. And this is what I want to be true. So I'm going to create a sequence of iterations. And so M, I'm going to add a third component. And M equals zero is my initial guess. Then I'll do M equals one is my first guess, M equals two. I'm going to get a sequence that converges. And how am I going to get to my m plus first guess from my mth one? I'm just going to pick my m plus first value to just satisfy this equation perfectly. So on this side, I'll use the mth values, and then I'll pick this guy to be, just satisfy each equation perfectly. So it's just, so that, and this is clearly just a weighted average of all the neighbors. And so now I've satisfied each equation perfectly, but of course, since I've changed all the values, you know, they're not, all the equations aren't simultaneously satisfied, so, but I will converge eventually. And so it turns out that the number of steps it takes to converge is going to be proportional to problem size. So if I have a little n by little n mesh with capital N unknowns, then it's going to take about capital N steps to converge. And so since each step updates each mesh point and does a constant amount of work, the amount of work to, up to take one step is order capital N. So the total work is capital N squared. But that's not very good, but it's still my building block. So this sort of illustrates the fact that as long as I'm 
my inner loop is going to be averaging with my nearest neighbors, I'm kind of hosed. I can't converge very fast. Which is, so, but let me just draw a picture to justify that. And so um, I claim that any method that all it does is a matrix vector multiply in the inner loop, touches the nearest neighbors, has to converge slowly. So here's kind of proof by picture. So suppose I want to solve my system of equations and I only, and let's say I want to just do gravity around the sun. So I have the sun at the middle and then all I want to compute is kind of like one over r squared. So here is the solution, one over r squared. And so what I want to do is figure out how, do, how fast am I going to converge when I st my starting guess is just a one in the middle and zero everywhere else, but this is what it has to converge to. So let's watch it converge. And so my right hand side looks like this. There's the sun, big mass in the middle, and it's zero everywhere else. And at every step of my iteration, I'm going to take my solution and average it with its nearest neighbors. So if I'm out here, I'm going to t my four nearest neighbors are all zero. When I average them, I stay zero. The only thing that can possibly change after one step is right next to the guy in the middle, right? Then the, the information will go out one grid point in every direction. Let's suppose I do it again. It'll go at one more grid point. I could only have non-zeros two grid points away. And here's what I get after I do it five steps. It's, it's going to be, I can only have touched this guy in the middle, the non-zero, if I'm close enough within five grid points. And out here, it's flat. That's what happens when information moves one grid point at a time. It just can't move very fast. And so remember, this is where I'm trying to get to. That's the true solution. This is after five steps. What's the best I could hope for for any algorithm that just talked to its nearest neighbors after five steps. I'd have to get zero if I'm far enough away, right? Because I'm only averaging with zeros. The best I could hope for is to get the perfect solution within a distance of, say, five, and then there's a cliff, and then it drops to zero. That's, you know, that's kind of the lower bound on any algorithm could do. The, the best case error is the height of that cliff, where it drops off to zero. And it doesn't drop off very fast, so I can't converge very fast. And so this is going to motivate us later when we do multigrid. I can't just talk to my nearest neighbors. I have to send information faster in order to have any chance of converging at a reasonable rate. We'll, we'll get there. But let me parallelize this because this is still going to be an inner loop inside of multigrid. So just to repeat the, the notation, so U is my uh, vector or my matrix of unknowns. And I want to go from step M to you know, iteration M to iteration M plus 1. I'm going to multiply it by a matrix, which averages with its neighbors. And so what I'm going to do is kept, I'm going to have two copies. I'm going to have the old copy, the mth. I'm going to have a new copy, the m plus first. And, and I'm going to you know, read that. I'm going to write that. And then I'm going to ping pong. I'm going to use this as the old, and I'll update that one. So I'm going to keep going back and forth. This guy will have all the, let's say, even iterates. That guy will have all the odd iterates. So what do I do at every step? So this is going to look very familiar. Suppose that here's my two-dimensional mesh, and I have four processors. I need to assign entries of the vector, mesh points to processors. Here's the way we've done it many times before. I'll assign each one a square grid. And so what does each processor have to do? At each point, it's going to get its four nearest neighbors. And if they're stored locally, there's no communication. It's going to do some computation, so the total work will be the number of mesh points over p, because each processor gets one piece of the work, and there's little n squared mesh points. And how much does it have to communicate? It's the usual boundary stuff, right? So this guy has to talk to a neighbor and get one piece of information. So the total communication is n over root p. So, so that's um, something we've thought about before. And which, how did we think about optimizing communication? When we did it for sparse matrix vector multiply, we had this trick where we could, you know, it looks like at every time step you have to talk to all your neighbors and communicate all that stuff, but you don't have to. And so let me just remind you of, what, of the trick that we used and explain how it even works better this time. So what I would like to do is take three steps. Sorry, I've changed notation. It was T on the last slide. Now it's A. Here is my vector of unknowns. I've written it out as a long, skinny vector. And I'm just going to do the one-dimensional case. I'll show you a picture this time of the two-dimensional case. And so here are all my unknowns. And I want to multiply by A. And so now, since I'm doing the one-dimensional case, it's tridiagonal. And so at every step, I need to talk to my, I need three neighbors. I need my two nearest neighbors because there's a guy in the diagonal and then the left neighbor and the right neighbor. And so this little blue triangle is who depends on whom. In order to compute the third entry of A times X, I need the second, third, and fourth entries of X. And so this is uh, very similar. This, this tells me the dependencies. 
when I showed you this picture before, it was, it was harder because the matrix, I had to store all the matrix entries. I don't have any matrix entries now because I know they're all minus ones, twos, and minus ones. I don't have to store them. And the other thing that makes it simpler is that in the, when I was doing this before, I needed a times x. I needed a squared times x, but I don't care about those. I just want the best answer, which is the a cubed part. So I can save all the communication of A, and I can save all the communication of all these intermediate terms. All I need is the last guy, the last row. So that eliminates a bunch more, and otherwise it's the same algorithm. So in the sequential case, I will read in all these entries. If, suppose I can only fit a quarter of my entries of X into cache at once. I'll read these in, and then I have enough information uh, because of the dependencies to compute all the entries inside that blue trapezoid, and then I, all I have to do is write the top row back out to main memory. That's all the communication I need. And now I'm going to keep on moving and do all this part. What do I have to save? You know, to get this guy, I need to save those two blues. So I'm going to keep the last two diagonals. And then I have enough to do the red. I'm going to read in the next bunch of entries of x, save those two diagonals. And that gives me all the information I need to compute everything in the red parallelogram. We've seen this picture before. And then I write out the answer, the top row of the red parallelogram. And then I do the green and the yellow. And so now, what has happened to the communication? When I did this before, I was very happy to claim that my communication went down to k times n. I just had to read and write everything once. Now it's gone down by another factor of k. I only have to move n words because I only care about reading the bottom row and writing the top row. And everything else gets computed on the fly and thrown away. So that's, that's as good as you can do. And I'm just showing, um, this is the one dimensional picture. I'll show you the two dimensional picture. So what about, uh, th this is a sequential case. What about the parallel case? It's a very similar idea. So here, I've, let's suppose I have four processors, and each processor is responsible for computing a quarter of the entries of the final result. And so uh, here is what processor one needs. Here's its dependencies. In order for it to compute all those entries, it needs everything inside the blue trapezoid. And so normally, the, the, the communication I'd like to avoid is that I need one message to send that guy to there, another message to send that guy to there, and another message, three messages, to send that guy to there. Instead, what I will do, just like last time, is package up all those three entries in one step, send them in one message, and compute everything inside the blue trapezoid. That means this, this little blue triangle will be computed twice. It'll be computed by processor one and by processor two. And so there's what processor two is going to do. It's going to get all of those packed up in one message, all those packed up in one message. So one latency cost per neighbor instead of three latency costs per neighbor. And then this is what processor three will do. And this is what processor four will do, all in parallel. And so all of those overlapping triangles at the borders will be done redundantly. So uh, hopefully, you know, if I have lots and lots of, if n is large, then most of the work will be done by a single processor and just these little guys in, on the boundary will be done twice. And so this is sort of the same uh, benefit that we got from in, in the matrix vector multiply case. And so here, just to show you the picture, is what it looks like for 2D. So now I have a two-dimensional mesh. And the green lines show you the uh, processor boundaries. And so the, the bottom layer is the, you know, the, the input vector. The next layer up labeled 1, that's a times x. The next layer up is a squared. And this uh, yellow, excuse me, this, uh, all these little black circles, that's my input data owned by the processor inside those green boundaries. And what does it need to compute everything uh, on the other three layers? It needs all of these ghost zones column. It needs three guys from that processor, three guys from that processor. And it needs these tiny little triangles from the corners. And so it has eight messages, you know, one for each of its eight neighbors, and it collects them all. And then it has everything it needs to compute that entire stack of black points. And what's computed redundantly, uh, those red points are, are input. Then these little red circles are redundant, and that, those uh, red circles are redundant. So hopefully not too much. So this, there's a lot of work that's been done on trying to automate this process so that you don't have to do it all by hand. And so um, I'm just going to give you a bunch of pointers to the literature where people have been trying to do this. And in fact, people are trying to automate it and put it in compilers. So that all you have to do, ideally, is you would write the most naive code with nested loops to describe what you want to do. And the compiler would recognize, oh, I can do all these optimizations for you, because I can recognize what all the dependencies are, because you have i minus 1 and i plus 2 and whatever it is. It'll figure that out for you. And let me just say that's ongoing work. So people are now trying to put that into compilers. Yes? 
Uh, so, silly question. Is doing the, the five nearest neighbors um, the same thing as doing A squared? Is that, how does it fit together? So, let me go back to the picture. So, um, let me do it in 1D. Well, so what this guy requires, that's A times X. He requires those three. Let me go back even a little bit farther. So to compute A times X requires those three. So you're asking if I were to apply it twice, what would I need? And I would have everybody inside that bigger blue triangle, which would require five points. And then if I go and ask what is required to compute all of those values, it, you know, follow all the triangles down, take their union, and you get everything at the base. Yes, and in two dimensions, the picture looked uh, like this. This isn't, giving exactly this isn't giving the same result as Jacoby, what is it? This is just an yeah, analogy, no, is, or they are exactly the same? It is exactly the same answer you get with Jacoby. All I'm trying, I'm going to do exactly the same arithmetic operations. All I'm going to do is move the data less. Right. So, but I do need to improve Jacoby. That'll be the next topic, because it doesn't, it doesn't converge fast enough. And so, as I said, people are trying to have, are doing this for, uh, so some of these, so uh, some of these applications, this is a very simple one. In real applications with structured grids, you may have dozens or hundreds of arrays, and, you know, and, and you're doing an enormous number of floating point operations on each one. It's not just averaging with your nearest neighbors. So that's why people are motivated to do this, and also to automate it if possible. So, you know, I invite you to go look at these, uh, at these uh, other results. So this work has also been done on, on another uh, architecture called a grid. That's where you have geographically distributed computers in different cities. And there the latency is enormous. And so people were motivated to do that so that you can spread out the computation even farther. And this idea has been around for a while. So let me just give you two older um, references. Um, there's a 1993 paper in Fox that referred to some of these ideas. They were also working on multigrid. That was their optimization. And the oldest reference that they found goes back to 1963. And in that case, of course, it was uh, core and drums as were the communication, you know, very old technology. But, you know, communication's been around for a while, and it's still important to optimize. Okay, that's all about Jacoby. It doesn't converge fast enough. What's the next step? And so I'm going to make two improvements. And, it, and they're both going to have, and they're both going to have the property. I'm still averaging with my neighbors. But so, what's the idea going to be? You know, as I'm, uh, as I uh, execute Jacoby, I'm updating some of my neighbors, and, and other ones are going to be old. So the simple idea is that when I get to a point, to, when I get to a particular i comma j, some of the neighbors will have the new values, some of the neighbors will have the old values. The new values are better. I will just use them. So whenever I get to a point and try to get my four neighbors, I will use the most recent data, whether it's from the nth iteration or the n plus first iteration. That will converge more quickly. And the other th uh, observation that people made is that let's suppose that I, to get from the nth iteration to the n plus first, I increment by some value. If that's a good, if that's a good direction in which to go, let me just go farther in the same direction. So instead of you know, incrementing it by delta, let me increment by 2 delta or 1.5 delta. And there's a magic number to pick that people have figured out for Poisson's equation. How much extra far should you go in that direction? And that's going to give us an asymptotically faster convergence. And so, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the inner loop, just to repeat, and the, of Jacobi. It says to get to the m plus first iteration, I use the mth iteration to average. Now I'm just going to use the latest data. And whether that latest data is m or m plus 1 depends on the order of execution. So I have to pick a clever order of execution so that the latest is always n plus 1. So I'm always averaging with something that's been updated. So let's see how I do that. So let's suppose I do, um, and this algorithm is called gauss seidel so it goes back a ways. And so what, what if I run the traditional order? So I'm just going <coughs> to update the first row, then I'll update the second row, then I'll update the third row. And finally, I get here, so I'm ready to update that guy. Who's new and who's old? Well, everybody above and to my left has been updated. So though, when, I, when I get my two nearest neighbors, that will be new and that will be new, but that one will be old and that one will be old. Now, the trouble with this is if I ask how can I parallelize it, there's no parallelization possible. I have to do it in this order. If I want to you know, preserve the exact numerical semantics that I always use the top and left neighbors are new and the right and bottom neighbors are old, I have to go sequentially row by row. 
And so I want to not do that. I want to update these in a different order so I can do lots of things in parallel. And so here's the code that I had there before that doesn't work. And so the idea is, what order am I going to do it? And the inspiration is from chess. I'm going to number all of the black nodes first, and then I'm going to number all of the red nodes. So if I look at this, all the black nodes have red neighbors, and all of the red nodes have black neighbors, right? So here's the idea. I'm going to look at all the black points, and all at once I'm going to update them by getting the old data from their red neighbors. Right? So here, to get to the m plus first iteration for a black point, I will get the nth iteration from the red points. They're all independent. I can run them all in parallel. Right? They don't depend on one another at all. Now, once I've updated all the black ones, it's the red ones need to get, get updated. So the new m plus first value of the red points, I take the black points, and they're all new. So I just grab them all at once. It's all parallel. And so, um, so th that's new, and that's new, that's old, and that's new. So this is called red, black, gauss seidel for obvious reasons. Now, this works very well if, you, I have, if I'm only connected to my you know, left, right, top, bottom neighbors. I'd like this to work for any structured grid, right? I could be talking to a whole bunch of different neighbors. How do you generalize this? And there's a graph algorithm that works. It's called graph coloring. So what you'd, I'd like to do is take each vertex in my graph and give it a color so that its neighbors all have a different color. And for north, south, east, west, we know how to do it. But in general, I could have lots of connections. And so what I'm going to use is that maximal independent set algorithm that I talked about before for figuring out how to do graph partitioning. So what I want to do is pick the largest set I can find where nobody's connected, where nobody's directly connected. I'll give that one color. Then I'll do, run the algorithm again, pick the, pick the biggest independent set out of what's left, give that another color, and just do that until everybody has a different color. And nobody is connected to a neighbor with the same color. And that way I can, you know, however many that takes, well, there's a famous theorem called the uh, four-color theorem. I know that if my graph can be done in the plane, I only need four colors, and it would take four parallel steps. So th in general, we know that this is a, you know, a possible thing to do. OK. So question, yes? What is the computational complexity associated with doing the graph coloring problem? So the algorithm that I think we talked about before was a, um, uh, a simple greedy algorithm which ran in linear time. And so I didn't talk, so you simply, you know, v visit all the vertices in some arbitrary order. And if uh, you find one who's not a neighbor of anybody you visited before, you just grab it and put it in the set. So it's all linear. Now, uh, that's not parallel. Um, and so there are ways you could imagine parallelizing it, but you know, th that cost would be um, uh, amortized over running this, the rest of the algorithm many, many times. So, um, but I think you can probably parallelize the uh, graph coloring problem too in a fairly natural way. But I, yeah, I couldn't, I, I'd have to look up a reference for you. Any other questions? Is that, is that uh, close enough? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> So, so, so this is part of the improvement. And so it turns out that if I do just what I described, always use the most recent information, it converges exactly twice as fast as Jacobi for the Poisson equation. That sounds good, but it also takes twice as many parallel steps. Right? If I think about Jacobi, everybody can update it, be updated in principle in one parallel step. But if I have to update the reds first and then the blacks, it takes two steps to make as much progress as one step of Jacobi. So, so it's a good idea, but it's not real asymptotic progress yet. So the next improvement is that what I'm going to do is let me just look at the inner loop of the algorithm. And it, they all look like this. To get from the mth iteration to the m plus first, I add something, right? So, and, and there's a formula for it in the previous slides. I, I don't need to repeat it. So the idea is if this is a good correction, if it's a good direction to move, I'm just going to move farther in the same direction. So I'm going to pick a magic number, w, bigger than 1. And instead of adding the correction, I'll add w times a correction. And this is called over-relaxation, right? Because I'm going farther in the same direction. And it parallelizes exactly the same way. The formula is almost the same. I just have to pick this magic number. And it turns out that for Poisson equation, people have analyzed this very carefully. And here is the magic number. It's 2 over 1 plus the sine of pi over n plus 1. And, and this is the topic of a different 
math course that I teach. And, and it, the good news is that uh, the complexity goes down dramatically. Instead of taking n squared for on a, n by n mesh steps to converge, it takes n, the square root of as many steps. And so the complexity now has gone from the number of steps times the cost per step, and that was n squared cost per step times n squared steps. So n to the f little n to the fourth, or capital N squared. So capital N is the number of mesh points for Jacobi, and now I'm down to capital N to the three halves. So that's a, a nice asymptotic improvement, but it still you know, is a long way from multigrid. I would like to do it in order capital N. But this is going to be a building block. So let me now just remind you of one, so any questions about SOR, the abbreviation for this? So let me just have one slide to remind you of one other algorithm which converges equally fast, and it was called conjugate gradient. And here is, the, we talked about this in an earlier lecture, I just want to give you a one slide reminder. So again, it is, and this applies to any symmetric positive definite linear system of equations. And, all I, and the lion's share of the work is done in the inner loop with a sparse matrix vector multiply. I can apply it to these stencils just as well. And there's also some Saxby's and dot products and things like that. And I keep repeating it again until the uh, error is small enough. And it converges, again, just like SOR, just as fast. It runs in uh, little n steps, or the square root of the number of unknown steps, specifically for Poisson equation. And we, we talked about this before, and I don't need to talk about it again very much, just to remind you that this, this gets us to n to the three halves, capital N to the three halves, and I want capital N. And so now, finally, we get down to multigrid, which is what I want to talk about next. So any questions before I get down to that algorithm? Of course, I have to tell you how to parallelize it, too. OK, so just to remind you, so this is going to be more complicated. And the reason is that all the algorithms I've talked about so far are limited by the fact that information moves one grid point at a time. If my matrix only averages with nearest neighbors, and the, the final answer, everybody depends on everybody, information moves too slowly to converge very fast. So it's going to take me at least n steps to move any information across an n by n grid. I want to converge in order one step. So I have to move information faster. And so I have to do it with something other than matrix vector multiply. And otherwise, I'll be stuck with this situation that I had before, where I, you know, the, informa I, the best solution I could have after five steps is I get this cliff. Okay. So what's the, what's the idea? And it's the same idea we've seen before. This is the third time we've seen this big idea. And remember, any trick used three times is a standard technique. So now this is a standard technique. So if you're far away, things look simpler. Right? And so for gravity, we've seen that for fast multipole. And so what I'm going to do is for stuff that's far away, I'm going to approximate it uh, by a simpler solution. I'm going to use a coarse solution and, uh, and use that to get an initial guess and repeat that recursively. So for graph partitioning, this is, so here are the three examples where this idea came up. So for graph partitioning, I replaced my graph with a coarser graph by leaving out every other mesh point. For fast multipole, I approximated you know, the Andromeda galaxy by its center of mass. And in, for multigrid, I'm going to re replace my fine mesh by a coarse mesh. And I'm going to solve the problem on the coarse mesh approximately, get an initial guess, and improve that. And, but my coarse mesh is still only going to be half as big. It's still enormous. I'll approximate it also by half as big a mesh. So I'll have a sequence of meshes, each one half as big as the other. Each one is a start, give me a starting guess for the finer mesh. So let me draw some pictures to say what I mean. So here is, let's say this is what my solution is on my two-dimensional mesh. It's a nice, smooth surface. And what I'd like to do is have some assurance that I can approximate it reasonably by something coarse. So here's the same function on a, a mesh which has half as many points in each direction. So if this is n by n, this is n over 2 by n over 2. And since this was nice and smooth, we can agree that that's a reasonable approximation for that. But I can't depend on that entirely, because I may have a solution that looks like this, and I still have to be able to approximate it somehow uh, with this kind of coarsening. So I need to have some way of saying that, of generating a, an approximation on a coarse mesh which captures enough information to be useful to approximate that mess. Okay. So here is the basic algorithm. At every step, I'm going to replace my problem on the fine grid by an approximation on the coarse grid. So find a coarse. I'll solve the coarse grid approximately, and 
use that as a starting guess for this guy. And then, since this is still very big, I'll do the same idea recursively. And so, but somehow I have to convince you that if this is really jaggy, it's worth doing. So I will have to use, uh, and I'll explain that with a picture of why that works. So to define the algorithm, I need some notation. So let me just tell you the notation in, in 1D, and then I'll draw a picture in 2D. And just to keep it really easy, I'm going to assume that the number of grid points I have is 2 to the m plus 1, so that every time I leave out every other mesh point, I get something of half as big. I'm going to let my problem solve the Poisson equation. Be sol uh, I'm going to use this superscript to mean I'm doing it on the mesh of size 2 to the i plus 1. So, so, P, let's say, so PM is my finest mesh, and then PM minus 1 is going to be my next finer mesh, and so forth. And so here's a picture. And so here is my incredibly fine mesh of nine mesh points. So there are all the black dots. I'm gonna, I want to solve Poisson's equation on those nine points. And just to keep it simple, I'm going to assume that the points at the end are fixed. Those are my boundary conditions. So the unknowns are just the seven guys in the middle. So here I have, uh, I have two cubed plus one or nine points, but it's only these two cubed minus one, these seven points that are the unknowns. And these are just fixed boundary conditions. And I'm going to write the linear equation of this dimension as ti times xi equals bi. And so, and here's my sequence of problems. So P3 is, solves it on nine points. P2, I'm going to take the, every other point, they're labeled in red, I'm going to get those five points, that's P2. And then I'm going to take every other point, get the points labeled one, and I, my, my courses problem just has three mesh points. And that's a boundary condition, that's a boundary condition, so I have one unknown in the middle. And I can solve a one by one system, that's my base case. So that's the one-dimensional case, which is, you know, it's multi-grid's not worth doing in one dimension, but it's easy to draw the picture. Here's the two-dimensional case. So I'm going to have a p to the m plus 1 by p to the m plus 1 two-dimensional grid. So there's my 9 by 9 grid when m equals 3. And I'll take every other mesh point, uh, and I'll call that uh, p2. That's my next coarser problem. So all those points are the black dots here. There's, that's my 5 by 5 grid. Take every uh, other mesh point again, and finally, my courses problem, there's one unknown, and all of these points on the outside are boundary conditions, which are given to me. And again, all the points on the outside are given boundary conditions. So I'm going to approximate this, you know, the fine points by the twos, the twos by the ones, and that's the way it's going to work. So the question is, what is my oper... So, so that's sort of a high level what I want to do, but how do I actually take a problem on the fine grid and replace it by a coarse grid? And once I solve it there, how do I go back to the fine grid? So let me give you some more notation. So my problem, remember, is P super I. I is the size of the grid. And BI is the right-hand side, and XI is the solution. So all of these are going to be living on grids of size 2 to the I minus 1. And so what do I need to do to do everything? I need three kind of operators, three kinds of averaging with your nearest neighbors. And the first one is called a restriction. That's going to take a problem that's on the fine mesh, and it's going to restrict it to the coarse mesh. So R stands for restriction. So I'm going to take a problem with 2 to the I mesh points and give me one with like 2 to the I minus 1 mesh points, half as big. And I'm going to just, and it's just going to be averaging with nearest neighbors. It's going to be another structured grid operation. And the way I'm going to write it in the code is please take the right-hand side that defines the problem on the mesh of size I and restrict it to a new problem where the right-hand side, the, you know, that determines the problem is of size 2 to the i minus 1. So I map from bi to bi minus 1. That's a restriction. Then, suppose I solve it there. So I solve the problem of, of this size with that right-hand side. I have to take it back. So I'm going to call that the interpolation operator. And that's going to take a, an approximate solution on the coarse grid, grid i minus 1, and map it back to the finer grid i. And again, it's just going to be averaging with nearest neighbors in some way to do that. And so, so here is the notation. I will take my coarse grid solution, I minus 1, and interpolate it so I get a fine grid solution on, on grid I. Now, I actually haven't done any work yet. I'm just sort of moving the problem from one grid to another. I actually haven't made any convergence prog progress yet. So there's one more operator I need where I actually do some work. And that's going to be called my solution operator, or sometimes called the smoother. And it's just going to be basically Jacobi or SOR on one particular mesh. And it's going to have some funny weights in it. It's going to be different from the ones I told you about before. And it's going to be basically kill the high-frequency error. So the, I'm going to make progress at each level of the grid by smoothing the solution and, ki and killing the, just the high frequencies of the error. And I'll, I'll draw a picture. 
So let me now write down the algorithm. It now fits on one slide if you let me use these subroutine calls. And then I'll show you how it converges. And this is going to be recursive. And the name of the function is going to be a multigrid v-cycle. I'll draw a picture on the next slide of why it's called a v-cycle. It takes as input the right-hand side, and it gives me the output x on a grid of size 2 to the i. And so it's going to uh, call itself recursively. So if I'm on the very, very coarsest grid where I only have one unknown, I just solve my one-by-one one problem in return. Otherwise, I have some work to do. And so I'm going to start by running a few steps of my weighted Jacobi and on, for my current problem, and I will then take, improve it, pr improve the solution. So xi is my starting guess. And xi, this xi is improved. I will have wiped out the high-frequency error. Then I compute the residual. That's whatever's left. Then here's the interesting recursive call. I take my residual, r, little r sub i, I restrict it to a coarser problem. So, I, so big R of little r gives me a problem on the coarse grid. And then I solve that problem recursively. I call the same subroutine. And I need a starting guess. I'll just guess 0. I can use any starting guess I want. And so MGV, so this gives me, this solves the problem on the coarser grid. What do I do with a coarse solution? I interpolate it back to the fine grid. So I call my interpolation on the coarse solution, and that gives me a correction on the fine grid. So this sort of just sequences subroutine calls, and I've color coded so you can see how the parentheses match. So now I have a correction on the fine grid, and I just subtract it from my current solution. And, it, and if I had solved it perfectly, you know, this would now be the perfect solution. And then, but it isn't, so I have to you know, do a few more steps of weighted Jacobi and prove it again. And now that's what I return, is my improved solution. Okay, so this magically is going to converge in a, bounded number, a constant number of steps. But let me say why it's called a v-cycle first. And that's simply because it calls itself recursively. It just sort of reflects the fact that it's a picture of the, of the call tree. So the horizontal axis is time. And so the, the algorithm is making progress from left to right. And the vertical axis is, is i. It's how, how fine the grid is. So that's the finest grid, P, uh, P5. And what do I do when I call multigrid on the finest grid? It calls it on the next grid, which is P4. And P4 calls itself recursively on, on 3. 3 calls itself recursively on 2. And finally, I get down to the coarsest grid, and I just solve it, the one-by-one one problem. Then I return, use that as a starting guess for grid 2. Grid 2 is a starting guess for 3, 3 for 4, 4 for 5. So it just reflects that picture of, of, the, of the cycle. So, the, so now, even though I haven't told you um, anything about what's on the inside of these subroutines, I know everything I need to say how long it takes to run. Because all I need to know is that each one of those subroutines just averages with the nearest neighbors. So it does a constant amount of work per grid point. That's all I need. So let me just convince you that this is optimal. Uh, let me, and I'll do it on a serial machine. At each point, um, how much, what's the work? It's proportional to the number of unknowns. Because for each unknown, I just average with its four nearest neighbors. So the total point, work at each point in this V cycle is just how many unknowns do I have? Times you know, four or something. So at each, how many unknowns are there at each level? It's a 2 to the i by 2 to the i grid. So there's 4 to the i unknowns at level i. And so I just have to sum this over each level in the grid. So it's 4 to the m, that's the finest one, plus 4 to the m minus 1, plus 4 to the m minus 2. It's a geometric sum. And the answer is 4 to the m, big O of 4 to the m. Almost all the work is done in the finest grid. So the work is proportional to the number of unknowns to do one v-cycle. As I said, I claim the number of v-cycles is constant. So this is, is optimal. And on a parallel machine, it's still very good. Uh, let's suppose I have my perfect you know, imaginary parallel machine, PRAM, with an infinite number of processors and communication is free. One processor will update each mesh point. So that means that each of these is going to run in constant time. So I just have to count the number of black dots in order to count the time. And, if, and how many black dots are there? Well, it's the log of the number of mesh points, right? It's, it's m, and m is the log of the number of unknowns, because the number of unknowns is 4 to the m, so take the log. OK, so that is a v-cycle. And now, in only three lines of code, I can tell you the ultimate final algorithm, which is called full multigrid. And it just does a bunch of v-cycles. So it's not much more complicated. So what I'm going to do in full multigrid is I'm going to solve the, the one by one problem perfectly. Use that as a starting guess for the 2 by 2 problem. Then I'll solve the 2 by 2 problem by calling a multigrid v-cycle. I'll use that solution as a starting guess for 
the grid at level three by calling a v-cycle. Then I'll use that as a starting guess for four, five, six. So I'm going to have one v-cycle starting at each level. So maybe a picture is the easiest way to say this. So I'll solve the problem at size one. I'll use that as a starting guess for the problem of size two, run a v-cycle. Use that as a starting guess for a problem of size three, do a v-cycle. Starting guess for four, v-cycle. Starting guess for five, v-cycle. So that's what the overall tree will look like. And so you can see that it's, again, a geometric sum, and the cost is just dominated by the very last v-cycle. And so it's still proportional to the number of unknowns. Uh, and in the PRAM time, um, this, um, this is going to cost me m. That's going to cost me m minus 1, m minus 2. So I get the log squared of the number of unknowns instead on this perfect parallel machine. So that's, um, so the cost of one of these cycles is, you know, optimal. How many cycles do I have to take? And so here is the theorem, <coughs> which I will simply state without any proof. And the theorem says you get one more bit correct every time you run a v-cycle. So if you have 24 bits, in the worst case, you have to take 24 steps, and that's all you have to do. And uh, so the error after, after you do a v-cycle is less than or equal to one half the error before the v-cycle. So one bit each time you do it. And so this is the most important feature of multigrid, which, you know, unlike all the other problems where the, you know, the bigger the problem, the slower it converges. Here that's not true. It's independent of how big your problem is. It always converges at the same nice constant rate, which is why people like to use it. Okay. So now I'm going to tell you what the actual operators are. But this is sort of the complexity. So now we understand all there is there. So let me tell you operator by operator what we do. And I'll just show you in, in one dimension. And as I said, it's basically Jacobi. So this is the solution operator, or smoother it's sometimes called. And so at each step, I'm going to take, replace my value by some weighted average of the nearest neighbors. Now what would pure Jacobi do? Pure Jacobi would take the neighbor to the left, the neighbor to the right, the right-hand side and multiply them, add them up and divide by a half. The only difference with weighted Jacobi is I'm going to multiply by a third and average in my own value. Okay? So the question is, why would I want to do that? And the answer is, this slightly different iteration is going to kill the high-frequency error. And so let me show you what I mean by killing the high-frequency error, by running three steps, just to show you. So, so what I'm going to do is run this algorithm and the true solution is this nice sine curve here. But my initial guess is going to be this jaggy thing. Okay. And the question is, how fast can I make this jaggy thing converge to the nice smooth curve? That's a little hard to see. So let me now just plot the error. So I'm just going to subtract the jaggy line from the smooth thing, and I get this. This is the error. And how am I going to measure, how am I going to you know, illustrate that the high frequency error gets killed? Let me look at the FFT. So th this is a vector. I can take its FFT. Here is the FFT. And so each of these points tells me how much, what component of this appears in each of these little sine curves, right? That's what FFTs do. And so up here, these components, those are the high frequency errors. And down here, these are the low frequency errors. So, and the two norm of this vector and the two norm of that vector are the same, because that's how FFTs work. And the norm is about 1.65. So now, let me take one step of that Jacobi algorithm, and, and I've drawn the picture here, but it's easier to look at this, which is the error, and it looks smoother, doesn't it? This somehow isn't as jaggy as that one, but the way to see that is actually to take the FFT, because the FFT tells me exactly where the frequencies are. And so here's the FFT of the error after one step. And look at the high frequencies. They've all been smashed down. That is reflected in this curve looking smoother. And the... Uh, Norm has gone down a little bit from 1.65 to 1.06. Let me do it one more time. I'm going to take one more step of weighted Jacobi. This looks even smoother. And now look at that. There look, there's not much left up there in the high frequency errors. So in fact, what you can prove is that every time you do a weighted Jacobi, all of these frequencies get multiplied by one third or less. So it's guaranteed to go down by a factor of one third at every step. That comes from you know, using all of these, this particular set of coefficients. And in 2D, there's a similar idea. So, so let me sh show you why this guarantees that we can converge in a constant number of steps. What we're basically doing is dividing, divide and conquer on the frequency. So here, I've drawn a cartoon of the FFT of the initial error for all the frequencies. And what I just showed you is that if I just run it on the coarsest grid, 
I zap everything in the upper half of the frequencies. So all of these guys are going to go away. So now what do I do? I take every other mesh point. I only have, so I've coarsened my grid. And it turns out that coarsening the grid means I can't see these high frequency errors anyway. I can only see the bottom half. So on the coarse grid, these frequencies show up. And when I do smoothing there, I kill the, high the, the upper half of all of those. So on the fine grid, I kill the upper half. Then on the coarse grid, I kill the upper half of what's left. I do it again. I take every other mesh point, And since my grid is coarser, I can only see the bottom half of the frequencies. And I kill the upper half of those. So every step of multigrid kills the upper half of whatever frequencies are left. And the intuition, perhaps, is that on a coarse grid, I can't have things wiggle very fast as on a fine grid. So I can only see half the frequencies I saw before. And it's the lower half of the frequencies. And this is, you know, can be used to do a proof, but we won't do that. So that's the smoother operation. It's averaging with your nearest neighbors with, with these nice simple coefficients. And in 2D, there's a similar average. So what about the smoother and, and, and the restriction? They're, um, the restriction and the interpolation, they're also very simple. So what does this guy do? The restriction, remember, he takes a right-hand side, a vector on my fine mesh, B sub i, and wants to map it to a coarser problem, which is in a, a vector that approximates it using every other point. So this is a very simple idea. So suppose my dotted line is my fine mesh point. So there are 16 points, and they're all connected by this dotted line. And I want to approximate that curve by, some, by using only every other point. So the easiest thing to do is simply take the even numbered points, right? I'll take that point, that point, that point, and connect them by a solid line. And that's one way to approximate it. That's a simple projection. It turns out you can do a little better by averaging with your neighbors. And so this point here is going to be a half times him plus a quarter times those two nearest neighbors. So a quarter times the left half times myself, a quarter times the right, and that gives me this different black line, and that turns out to converge a little bit faster. So this is, again, just averaging with my nearest neighbors, but that's going to be my restriction operator to go from the fine dotted line to the coarse solid line. And in 2D, I have eight neighbors, but there's a similar weighting. And interpolation, it's even easier to think about. So now I have a coarse approximation. Every, you know, I have eight points, and what I want is 16 points. So I'm just going to you know, connect the dots and pick my point halfway through. And so when I, if I'm given these eight points and I want a 16-point version of it, I'll just you know, take the midpoints of all those line segments. And, and that, so it's just a very simple interpolation. And in 2D, again, I have to just average with my nearest neighbors. But I may have four neighbors instead of two, depending on, on the grid. So now let me show you how fast it converges. And I'll just show you two pictures to convince you that it does actually converge in a finite number of steps. I'll show you a 1D convergence, all the details, and then a 2D convergence. So I want to solve Tx equals b, one-dimensional. Here's b. Here's my right-hand side. It's zero almost everywhere, except there's a plus a half and a minus one half, and then a plus one and a minus one. So four non-zero entries. And here's the true solution. So it's kind of jaggy. So this is my input. This is what I want for my output. I'm going to run multigrid, and I'm going to say how fast does it converge after each uh, multigrid v-cycle. And so what I'm plotting, I'm plotting here is the residual as a function of the number of iterations on a log scale, and it's a straight line, and the slope is uh, 0.2. So this, this plots the residual at step m divided by the residual at step m minus 1. So how much smaller does the error get? And it gets smaller by a factor of about 0.2 at every step. And so this is converging nice and fast. And here is a plot of the actual error at every step. So the initial error on a log scale, so the initial error is nice and jaggy. And so what do we expect? We expect the error to get smoother. And indeed, as you look at these later error curves, they're getting smoother and smoother. And we also expect it to converge at a high rate. So that on this log scale, it means the distance between these consecutive error curves is the same. It's about a factor of 0.2. And so it's converging nice and fast as we expect. Let me just show you the same picture in two dimensions. So here's the true solution on my two-dimensional mesh. So it's one there, minus one there, and zero most everywhere else. And the right-hand side is kind of this jaggy thing, lots of plus ones and minus ones and zeros. And here what I've, I've, I've shown you is the ratio of the error or the residual at step m plus one divided by m. It's 0.4, so it's a little bit slower than the 1D case, but I still get it more than one bit for every iteration. And there is the residual, you know, on a log scale, and it's sloping downhill with a slope of 0.4.
And so uh, we can see that it is converging very nicely. So any questions now about the basic algorithm? And now I have to paralyze it. So as usual, I spend a little while explaining why it works, and now I have to make it run in parallel. So here is the picture of what goes on in um, parallel 2D multigrid. It's going to be using Jacobi on the inside, so no surprise, it's a lot of the same ideas. So here I have a 32 by 32 grid of points, the little dots, and, on a, and I have a 4 by 4 grid of processors. So each processor is going to own a square subgrid and, the, and be responsible for updating all the points on the inside. It's the same idea. The question is, who do I have to communicate with and how much? And so I'm, I'm labeling the points to make that a little bit clearer. I'm starting with um, uh, a 32 by 32 grid of fine meshes. So I've labeled all the fine mesh points by five, at least the ones that processor owns. Then every other mesh point I take to get the, P, the problems of, of size P4. And then the problems on problem P3, again, take every other point of the four, and there are two. So when I, by the time I get to here, each processor only owns one unknown. It does not going to have much work to do. And if I go to the next coarser grid, some processors are going to be idle. That, that's what happens in this business. Once I make it coarse enough, some processors will have no more grid points and will just sit there idle. I may ch choose not to do that, but at least that's the simplest thing you can do. And so here, this picture says, who do I have to communicate with? So let's just look at this. So let me ask, what does the pink processor do at every step of a V cycle? So on the coarsest level, at each level, he's going to average with the nearest neighbors, whether he's doing smoother or interpolation or whatever. It's always averaging with your four nearest neighbors. So for the, uh, some point in the middle, the four nearest neighbors are all stored locally, no communication. It's only when you're on the boundary that you have to talk to a neighbor. And so let's suppose I'm updating the blue points on the finest grid. If I'm here, I have to get everybody who's labeled five sitting on the, on the neighbor. And so I need to talk to my... Um, uh, eight neighbors and get all of the points labeled uh, five in blue. Then on the coarser grid, again, so now I'm only going to have every other point. Let's suppose this one. So now my four neighbors are there, 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 and there. These two are local. Th that number four and that number four are on different processors. So again, there's communication involved, but half as much as before. And it's still the same eight nearest neighbors. Then when I get to the points labeled three, that one, that one, that one, and that one, my nearest neighbors are there, there, there. Well, you can see them. They're labeled three. So I'm, again, I'm getting half as much information from my neighbors, but it's the same eight neighbors. And finally, at two, I, I need one number from all my neighbors. And so this is the picture. And that's all I need to know to write down the complexity. And I get a bunch of geometric sums and for the same reason as before. So here's a slide where I write down all the complexity. And, but now it's a little bit more interesting because there's two cases. There's the case where every processor owns at least one. Those are the finest meshes. And then at some point, the, the, the grid has gotten so coarse that there's some processors that are idle. And so um, I'm, I'm only going to compute the complexity for the guys who need one piece of data from their neighbors. And so what do I have here? I'm going to start with an M, you know, 2 to the M by 2 to the M grid of, of points. So here it was 2 to the 5th by 2 to the 5th. I'm going to assume I have 4 to the K processors arranged in a 2 to the K by 2 to the K grid. So here, in this particular picture, K is 2, because it's a you know, 4 by 4 grid of processors. And I do a 1 V cycle, and I can count the number of flops at each level. I can count the number of messages, which is 1 for each neighbor. Alpha is the latency. And I can ask, how much do I actually have to send? It's, and it's a si you know, the length of a side, and that's 2 to the j minus k times the reciprocal bandwidth. And so I can sum up all of these layers, sum it from j equals 1 to, to k, and I get these formulas. And so let me just put it all in a table so we can just compare it. So you can do the algebra yourself. So what I want to compare is multigrid, SOR, the fast Fourier transform, which is also really fast, but at a later lecture, and I want to compare how many flops they do, how many messages they send, and how many words they send. And so let's look at the flops first. And so multigrid wins. It does order n flops. I've left out all the big O notation here. Each processor does an equal amount of work. So the work per processor is n over p. Perfect speed up. Except there's this log term that's sort of, you know, because there's some extra reductions and stuff. The FFT also speeds up perfectly, but it does n log n flops, uh, paralyzed by p. And SOR sp speeds up perfectly, but remember, it did end of the three halves, so, so this is uh, asymptotically larger than all of those. 
So let's now go look at the number of words sent. I'll leave messages for last. So the number of words sent is basically the square root of, uh, for multigrid, is the square root of the number of flops. So this is asymptotically much, much smaller. So hopefully it, doesn't, it isn't too, too bad. And again, there's a little extra log term. The FFT and the S and SOR are asymptotically worse, right? They, they take the square of the number of words sent. So, so it looks like multigrid is winning. But now let's look at the number of messages. So the number of messages here, they're not really strictly comparable. Well, I mean, SOR loses, but is log n squared bigger or is the square root of p bigger, right? That depends on the relative sizes of n and p. And so depending on your particular platform, it's not clear whether multigrid or FFT will win, you know, because this term could be dominant and either one might be dominant. So that's why they're, they're both used in practice. You know, they're, they're both good ideas. Okay. So uh, let me talk about some practicalities. So this is the most basic algorithm where we can sort of see regular meshes. So in practice, you don't all go down all the way to a one-by-one one problem. There's just way too much overhead. We've seen that before. So you stop when it's a bit coarser, and you use some other solver on that. Uh, you may also choose to say, uh, I'm going to take my problem because I have too few pro um, unknowns per processor and just map the whole thing to fewer processors and run it all on fewer processors. People do that. Um, in the sequential code, the coarsest grids are negligibly, negligibly cheap because you know, you're doing a one quarter of the work at each level. And so you'd say, oh, this is asymptotically negligible. But on a parallel machine, the coarse grids can still be very expensive. So let me just give you an illustration. So suppose I have a thousand points. You know, so I have a fairly big chunk of data on a processor. So I'm going to do about, you know, order a thousand flops on them. Let me ask, how much communication do I have to do? Well, if it's a two by two mesh, those thousand points are going to be organized in a square root of a thousand by square root of a thousand grid. It's going to have four edges, and so four times the square root of a thousand is 128. So there's going to be 128 words communicated, and that's you know a sizable fraction of a thousand. And what about in a 3D mesh? So my thousand points are occupying a 10 by 10 by 10 grid, right? That's a lot of points, but how many points are on the boundary? Well. Uh, the points that aren't in the boundary are the, are the little 8 by 8 by 8 cube inside your 10 by 10 by 10 cube. And so the number of points on the boundary of this cube is about half, right? Because that's high dimensions are like that. And so there's an awful lot of communication even if you have 1,000 points left over. So, so you know, how to optimize that you know, it's, is, becomes interesting. So let me show you some performance data, uh, starting with some very old and working up to some newer. And so this was the first time people tried to really parallelize this well. And so this was on an, you know, what was an enormous machine in 1993, 1,024 processor n cube. And so they first started off with a 64 by 64 grid over all 1,000 processors, uh, again, 2D. And so there were only four unknowns per processor. And you can imagine the efficiency was pretty bad. It was 2% you know, efficiency, if you ask. So efficiency means how how much time do you spend overall versus just the flop? So this man had spent most of its time doing, uh, most of its time doing communication because it was only 2% efficient. And the full multigrid where I did multiple cycles was even worse, you know, 0.8%. But when they got up to 1,000 by 1,000 grid on 1,000 processors, that was enough to keep all the processors pretty busy and it was 70% efficient for multigrid and 42% for the full multigrid. Um, so this machine made their problem easy because the communication was really fast and the processors were really slow back then. So, but this is still a problem today. Um, Chombo is a code they use at LBL and it's used for adaptive mesh refinement. And again, it's the communication in the coarsest meshes that is killing them and they're working on optimizing that. So, so now let me continue with saying how real codes look on real multigrid. So for starters, people don't run it on regular meshes all the time because the real world is not entirely regular. So here's an example of a molecular dynamic simulation. So here's a bunch of atoms and, and so forth. And what you really want is a very accurate value of the electrostatic potential near the atoms. And you don't really care about this open space, right? Because nothing's moving out there. So your mesh is going to be very fine near these atoms. And it's going to be very coarse out here. And you still want to solve the Poisson equation on this. So this is called an adaptive mesh. The, the mesh is going to depend on your problem, and it's going to move as the particles move. And so you, are, you, know, you want to solve this by using lots and lots of little structured grids. So that little grid there may be a perfectly you know, n by n mesh, the kind we just looked at. But you know, some of its neighbors are coarse, some of its neighbors are fine. And your data structures have to take that into account. So, so you may have 
uh, a system of equation on a union of rectangles. So the way people typically describe these is that here's a bunch of rectangles. These are fine. You know, th the blue one may be finer than the red one. And you sort of glue them all together, and you still want multigrid to work. And that has been figured out. And it also leads to a load balancing problem. Sorry, I'm going a little faster here because I want to get to discussion of the class projects. So uh, it's a load balancing problem. I mean, that was pretty obvious from this picture that some processors are going to have, you know, I can't just uh, do spatial domain decomposition because these processors will have no work to do to compare to those. So I have to somehow assign grids to processors in a reasonable way. But I also want to make sure that neighbors are assigned to neighbors. It's the usual locality problem. So, uh, and of course, these grids are moving over time as the particles move. So we've seen that problem before. And so people have built a lot of tools to try to automate this process. There's a, uh, a, spe there's a language called Titanium, which was developed here based on Java for parallel programming. It was specifically designed to help make adaptive mesh refinement work. And so they have a new kind of structure in the language called domains. Um, there are a bunch of libraries people have built to keep tr to so that all these ghost zones are built for you automatically. And so if you choose to do adaptive mesh refinement as a class project, please don't reinvent any of these things. You know, we can talk about what tools are available for you to use. Still, all of these, pro pro these flavors of adaptive mesh refinement come down to working on regular meshes. People also want to do multi-grid on irregular meshes or unstructured grids. So this is sort of the, another dwarf. It's unstructured grids. But let me just show you a few pictures and get to the really big simulations people have done. So you know, people want to use unstructured meshes for obvious reasons because it's just easier to map to complicated geometries. So this particular simulation was um, you know, it's semi-regular. This was a, a tire simulation. So this stuff in the middle was steel. This stuff on the outside was rubber. And it was an elastoplastic you know, finite element simulation of how the thing deforms when the tire is rolling around. And so this uh, was a sort of a warm-up. And it, it ran with 39 million unknowns on 960 processors and got 50% efficiency. And uh, the tricky part to make this work is we have to partition that graph. It's now no longer you know, nearest neighbor. It, it's not square, you know, rectangular anymore. And so we have to figure out how do we do the partitioning. That'll become a graph partitioning problem again. Um, what does it mean to do multi-grid anyway? You have to figure out what interpolation and smoothing and so forth means. And it still turns out to be nearest neighbors, but there's a bunch of math to figure out the coefficients. Um, how do you coarsen the problem? Uh, you can't just pick every other grid point if you have a tetrahedral mesh or something like that. So it turns out the right thing to do is use those maximal independent sets again. That's a good way to take every other mesh point. Um, and uh, so let me just show you a picture of, of how this works. So here is a tube, which is a somewhat irregular mesh. And what you'd like to do is take every other mesh point but preserve the geometry. And so there's a tool that uh, uh, Mark Adams built to do this, which tries to take every other mesh point but preserve the geometry by um, pr having preferential treatment for the, for, the, for the boundary points. So the boundary points you try to keep, and, and the internal points are, are less important. So this is, a still, this is sort of a hollow tube. That still looks like a hollow tube. This one's less so. And finally, that one, is, you've kind of lost the geometry because it's kind of hard to keep it all when you coarsen so much. But this is what people try to do as they coarsen. So let me finish with one uh, prize-winning example of an enormous multi-grid simulation. And here, the goal was to understand when a person with osteoporosis falls down, are they likely to break a bone? So that was sort of the motivating biological application. And the way science begins is you take uh, a bone from a cadaver, and you create a very detailed finite element model of this bone, and, you, and then you exert a force on it, which would be the same force from the elderly person falling in a certain way, and you ask, would it break? Now, what do people do today in order to you know, give advice to elderly people? They measure the bone density. It turns out bone density is a pretty rough, not terribly accurate way of saying, do you need to have treatment for your osteoporosis? And so it would be much better to do a very detailed finite element model. So how did they do that? So they took this bone, and they needed to discretize it. So how do you get all the information out from the inside of that bone? You use what's called a micro CT scanner. So you put it in this box, and you irradiate it with a lot more radiation than a real patient would use. And you come up with a very detailed 3D image that's good down to 22 microns. So you can basically resolve every last detail of that bone. And of course, most of it's open space, right? Because that's the way bones are. And so this is what the 3D image looks like. And then you can discretize it. You can build lots of little 3D elements um, just following the, the 3D image. 
and run a finite element model on that using you know, the mechanical properties of bones. And they ran it for 537 million unknowns, which was the largest problem done at the time, on 4,000 processors, and they got 70% parallel efficiency using all those multi-grid tools I was telling you about before. And this won the Gordon Bell Prize in 2004, and it has since become actually uh, commercialized in a startup. Um, you cannot you know, do this kind of radiation on a real patient, so what you do, it turns out that you can do uh, a, you know, a regular MRI scan, uh, and that, and which does not give you this resolution, but it turns out to be good enough to get uh, clinically relevant data for patients to do. And this is work that was done by uh, Tony Kiveny here in mechanical engineering and Panos Papadopoulos in collaboration with a joint student. So that is all I wanted to say about structured meshes, and I have a few minutes left to talk about class projects. So does anybody have any questions about structured meshes? or unstructured meshes, which is really what I ended with. Okay. So I wanted to give some high-level advice on what a class project looks like and give you pointers to lots of old ones so you can see what people have done in the past just to give you, you know, some, some inspiration. So there's lots and lots of different kinds of projects that are possible, and that reflects the fact that the people, you folks, are come from many different departments. There's lots of great projects that can be done depending on your background. But basically you should think that you have to do one or more of design or program or measure some parallel application, or kernel, or software tool, or hardware. So it's a cross product, design, program, or measure, <laughs> and then application, kernel, tool, or hardware. And you can work alone or in a team, whatever, whatever you want to do is fine with me. One of the reasons for homework zero was posted, where you, you know, described something you wanted to parallelize was to help you identify possible teammates. And so what, you, what I'd like you to do is give me the project proposal by early next week, I think I suggested Monday, and then we'll have a conversation, right? You know, it's not a final proposal, it's a conversation. And I'll give you some feedback. And then we're going to have a poster presentation. And I believe that's going to be Thursday of RRR week. And what I'd like to do, if you're willing, is to record your video presentations here in this room and then have the posters outside because I think it's very useful for later classes to see, you know, a, a presentation is one minute, you know, just uh, to talk about what your project's about so that people can be inspired about doing things in the future. And then the final report write-ups will be due later. You know, get a little bit of time to work on that. So let me just say a few more words about how to organize a project proposal. So again, I said you could parallelize or compare implementations of an al application. Um, you know, so you don't have to write, do the coding yourself. That's always welcome, of course. But so you could take you know, different approaches to a problem and ask which one is better, why, you know, measure the, uh, uh, you know, do some detailed performance analysis of it. You could do the same thing for a kernel, you know, a particular you know, motif that you're interested in running. You could build or evaluate a parallel software tool. We've talked about many during the semester, and there are more. Uh, or you could do something at the hardware level if you're, that, you know, if you're a computer scientist and want to do that. So um, what I'd like to see in your class project is the list of tasks that you'd like to try. And they should be sorted in order from low-hanging fruit, you know, stuff that you're obviously going to do, to some other, gee whiz, wouldn't it be nice if I could do this some someday kind of stuff. Even, you're probably not going to get to that, but it would be just nice to have this sort of inspiring vision for what you might like to do. Um, then I'd like, I'd like to know what kind of tools you're planning to use, just to make sure that you're not reinventing wheels, that you're using the latest technology, and I'm happy to make suggestions if you're not sure what the latest technology is. And for, if you're going to do an application, then I uh, recommend that you consider using frameworks like Chombo and Petsy, and there's a long list of them, Trulinos. We're going to have a lecture later in the semester. It's just hard to schedule. In the meantime, you can go to the website for the uh, spring tw uh, 12 version of this class, and lecture 21 is a lecture on video uh, about all these different frameworks. And so you might consider using one of those. Uh, and then for applications, if you're you know, working at that level, I'd like you to use the language of patterns uh, both computational and structural that you've seen before to sort of say, here's how I'm going to architect it. You know, here, here's where the, you know, the time is going to be spent because that's the point of those patterns, to help you uh, do that kind of architecting. And then it would be nice to hear what are your success metrics. 
So for example, I want to get application X up on Hopper to solve some science problem Y. That, that would be one thing way you could do it. Or you want to get a particular motif Z to run W times faster on a particular architecture like a GPU. Or I want to collect some sort of data, performance data V, to evaluate and compare a bunch of different approaches. What data are you going to collect? So you know, at a high level, that's what I'd like to hear. So let me tell you about some sample projects from the past. And so these ones actually have all the video up. And so uh, there was content-based image recognition. That, this was early in the PAR lab. And so this was, you know, the application was, here's a picture of you know, my sister and her friend. Please find me all the pictures uh, where they are standing side by side you know, in this database. Right? So that was an early application. The next one was uh, modeling molecular dynamics. It was a, a molecule called amyloid beta peptide and how it changes to a different kind of molecule that was coming up in Alzheimer's disease. Um, speech recognition, again, this was something that was early in the PAR lab, so uh, paralyzing inference engine. There were some uh, algorithms to to tolerate errors, new genome sequencers. Genome sequencers generate lots and lots of data, but they have errors in it, so it was a new parallel algorithm to accommodate all the errors. Uh, there was a, a biologist who was uh, simulating a marine zooplankton uh, uh, population. They're a big part of the food chain. They live at the bottom of the ocean, and they were trying to figure out how that is affected by climate change. Uh, and then um, there were some undergraduates who were motivated by the fact that you know, they're standing there outside trying to play a game on their cell phone. They don't have enough bandwidth. Their friend is standing next to them uh, with some uh, separate bandwidth. Could they get together and you know, share their bandwidth and run the game in parallel over their two, uh, two phones and have a better gaming experience? So that was what they tried to do. So uh, here are some more projects. And, I'm not, and, and if you go to the website, uh, this and click on them, it'll lead you to actually the final project summary. So there was, you know, and this is from different semesters. And so you can see there's, this was a ParLab uh, project. This was sort of fast summing of images that were needed for rendering. Uh, this was uh, comparing distributions of points from a nonlinear feedback control system. Um, this was uh, K, uh, parallelizing a k-means algorithm for searching databases. Let's see. This one had to do with uh, electronic structure calculations uh, to determine reaction mechanisms, uh, sparse matrix vector mul multiplication on GPUs is, is what it sounds like, and this had to do with hartree frock electro electronic structure algorithms. And there's even more, right? So if you go click on these, you're welcome to see what people have done in the past, and uh, you're welcome to do something that, you know, similar, right? You, you don't have to exclude these from consideration, but they'll just give you an idea of the design space of all the things that you might want to do. So, and it goes on and on. There have been lots of interesting projects in the past. So that's a good place to stop. And have a great spring break. <laughs>